Hi, I'm Pastor Brad from His Outpouring Church. I want to personally invite you to come to His Outpouring Church this Saturday at 6 p.m. We meet off Center Court inside the East Ridge Mall in Casper, Wyoming. Every Saturday at His Outpouring Church, you can expect the presence of God to touch your life in a new way. You may give a prophetic word or solution to a problem or experience healing. There's a great environment for kids and an encouraging message for you. Maybe you've been looking for a church or maybe not. Either way, we really want to see you at His Outpouring Church this Saturday evening. Come explore faith and meet some great people in the process. I cannot wait to see you at His Outpouring Church in East Ridge Mall this Saturday at 6 p.m. Okay, so last week we talked about Moses. Who, who remembers last week? It was good, wasn't it? Glory to God, God is good. Hallelujah. So we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to pass in review. So what happened was, pass in review is a term that my pastor used to use. It's funny how, how, how you pick up things. So um, what, what happened is Moses goes up to, to the mountain to, um, to get the tablets, which are the, which are the Ten Commandments, right? And, and while he's up there, what happened? Um, they, they what? The Israelites were worried on Absolutely. Yeah. To make a golden calf, right? What is so interesting to me about this, though, is they took their earrings off their ears, and they melted their earrings, and then they said, this God is the one that delivered us when it was their own jewelry. <laughs> now, now, there's a lot of significance in that. So the jury, with the jury... I didn't do it, Your Honor. So the jewelry, the jewelry would be what? It would be your glory, wouldn't it? Yeah. There's, I mean, there's a lot there. There, there is a ton there. So then, so then he gets upset and he breaks the tablets. And God says, and this is the part I love, where God says, your people that you brought out of Egypt, and I'm thinking, I don't know where you got that. I don't want to question Elohim, but that was an interesting statement there. I kind of like that about God. He wants to like nuke them. Every time he turns around, Steve, he just wants to let them have it. I kind of like that a little bit because you know that he's got a personality. <laughs> and it says that, that, that he understands the feelings like, like you know, we do. So uh, anyway, have you ever told God, thank God, I'm not God? I tell you what, by the time you were 18, you'd have cleaned out half of the country. <laughs> I don't want those people anymore. Let them go. Thank goodness for Jesus. So, um, so then Moses goes back up. He spends 40 days with God again. And this time, whenever he comes down, the glory of God is shining through his face so much that it scares the people. Do you know the glory of God will scare people? Especially when you get in the holy reverence of God. I mean, it ain't no messing around. When you get around the creator of the universe and get into that deep place with him, it's different. It's absolutely different. Has anybody been afraid to go to church? Raise your hands. Really? You guys haven't been afraid to go to church? Are you kidding me? First time I went into a charismatic meeting, I was looking for the back door. Dear Lord, are you kidding? They were acting weird. They were jumping around saying hallelujah and all this kind of stuff. And, and the denomination I was in, I never even heard the Holy Spirit mentioned like maybe once. You know, and, all, and the only thing he did is he convicted you of sin. That was it. He couldn't do anything else. Has anybody ever heard that? Yep. Yet the Bible says all the way through it that he's a comforter, he'll walk with you, he'll do this, he'll do that. So, I can remember how I felt though, but I couldn't get out of that church fast enough. But about a week later, I wanted to go back again. Isn't that weird? You kind of felt that drawing, you know? Vicki tells a story about um, how, how their pastor went, you know, hours on end and the, and the, and the glory would fall. So, anyway, Vicki's got a great story about going to Haiti. She's got the best Haiti story I've ever heard. One of these weeks, we're going to have her give her testimony. Uh, it's a heck of a story. It's funny, you just don't know who you're around. You don't know who, who somebody knows, who somebody has been with, and, you know, you just don't know. The other night, we were, at the, we were watching, Sharon and I went out for dinner, and we were watching a hockey game on TV. It was, it was the All-Star game. We were sitting there just, just, just watching that at the restaurant, and I said, wow, those guys look like Gordie Howe. And she goes, well, I, I uh, was, I, what, what, you hosted Gordie Howe for how long? For a weekend. She hosted Gordie Howe for a weekend. I said, you did not host. Who, who knows who Gordie Howe is? 
Who does not know who Gordy Howe is? Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay. No wonder you're looking at me like a... You're, you're looking at me like, did we lose a rope? I mean, did, did, uh, did we find a rope or lose a cow? I mean, that's what you're, you're kind of looking at me like, what? Gordy Howe was probably one of the greatest hockey players that ever played. He played till he was like 114 or something. Anyway, he was, a, he was a great... It would be like Tom Brady. Does anybody know who Tom Brady is? Okay, we got one person who doesn't know who Tom Brady is. All right, it would be like uh, President uh, Reagan. Does everybody know who President Reagan is? It's not, it's not that big. But it's, but it's just interesting how people... I don't know how I even went down that road. Anyway, so, so the glory is shown, right? So Moses had to veil his face, so we stopped there. Can you imagine having so much glory... That, that they have to veil your face. Can you imagine freaking your friends out so bad that you've got to cover your face so they won't run from you because the minute you take the veil back, it looks like your face is a lantern. That'd be weird if you saw somebody that had a lantern face, wouldn't it? That's basically what he had. You know, he lived to be 120. And I just finished the Moses book like two days ago. Yeah. I was like, glory to God. That was, that, that was a two-year endeavor. Yeah. And I, and I learned a lot about Moses. And it's like he's my friend now. And now I'm seeing him all through Scripture. So, um, so we're going to talk about what happened during that time, okay? Is, is that fair enough? So we're just going to continue on from there. So what does the veil, and if you've heard me, if I've talked to you this week, you cannot play. What does the veil on Moses' face represent? Yes, the curtains on the tabernacle. Very good, you get 10 points. I'm, I'm giving out points tonight. You get, you get 10 points. The veil on the tabernacle. So what happened whenever the veil on the tabernacle was split open? What occurred? Access to God. Okay. Okay. So what was in the most holy place? So you, you see you had the outer court, the inner court, and the most holy place, right? And the veil was there. So, so the Ark of the Covenant, which was what? What was it? Don't everybody yell out at one time. Go ahead. Mercy seat. What else was there? The tablets, right? The rod, Aaron's rod that sprouted. What, what, what would that represent, Aaron's rod that sprouted? Authority. But what kind of authority? New authority. There's a better authority coming, right? Because the rod stands for authority. Can you imagine your? Can, can you imagine pulling out your grandpa's old cane and it's all sprouted? That would be the, like, whoa, that was weird. You guys would be calling me to come clean your house out. <laughs> so, and I would. So um, the manna was there. So what the manna represent? The bread of life, provision, right? What else was there, Gene? What was the other one? The lampstand. I would. Uh, what else, what else was in the ark? In the ark, it was Aaron's rod, the tablets. The tablets, wasn't it? Okay. So, so I got it right. So whenever Jesus came, what did he do? What's that? Were they the first set of tablets? Second. They were the second. Second, because you've got to realize, Moses, when Moses threw the tablets, did he have to do that? No. Could he have just, like, kept them? Yeah. Right? He could have kept them. <laughs> but why did he throw them? Because every, every time he had a hissy fit, what happened to him? He got in trouble. Yep. You know what i Every time Moses had a hissy fit, he got in trouble. And this is no different. <laughs> I love Moses. He went from not knowing what to do to getting in trouble. <laughs> Glory to God. Makes me think of some of you guys. Hallelujah. Has anybody here gotten in trouble? <laughs> Oof. I, was, I was driving tonight. And the Lord, uh, there, was a, there was a couple who had left our church. And uh, the Lord says, I want you to text him right now and, and speak a blessing over him. And I was like, I don't want to. And he goes, do it anyway. I said, but you don't know what they did. And I went, I don't care. And I was like, you know, he's right. Hallelujah. How long are you going to? Was that Rael? All right, there's only one preacher here tonight. How, many t how long are you going to let that thing separate you? How many times are we going to throw the tablets down? Right? So let's go pick them up again. He didn't have to throw those tablets down is my whole point. So what did God do? God said, great, you did it, so you get to make new cab uh, cabinets, tablets. Now, can you imagine, what kind of tools did you have back then? You didn't have a power saw, right? You had a hammer and chisel. And could you imagine making tablets out of stone? 
Imagine going up to Casper Mountain and just making tablets out there. David, how long would that take you? And can you, you'd almost get done and one would break. Have you ever had that happen? Hit it wrong and boom, here it goes. And then Moses and God together wrote the Ten Commandments. This time God did not give him everything. He appreciated what was there. I think he paid better attention because this time he came back with the glory. So the veil represents Jesus' body as well. So you have to understand, back then what happened was this. Was the high priest, the regular priest could go in out of the, out of the tribe of Levi. The regular priest could go into the temple, but only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. Now how many times did, uh, did uh, he go into the inner court? Once a year, right? And did he have to get it together before he went in? They had a rope tied around him that if the power of God zapped him, right? And if his bells kept jingling, they pulled him out. Now let me ask you a question. <laughs> Steve, think about this. It's your turn to go in. You're like, no, 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 how about Rich? It's, I think it's Rich's turn. No, no, it's Gene's turn. <laughs> it's Michelle's. It ain't my turn. I know it's not my turn, right? But I mean, don't you think you would sanctify and get it together before you went into the most holy place? And then what did Jesus do? He ripped the veil, Gene says, from the top down, and he gave us free access to now boldly go in to where back in the day, you could, you, you, you could possibly lose your life by going in there without, without, without your heart pure. Right? Is that true? I'm not a Bible scholar, as you can obviously tell. So think about what Jesus did. He opened up and gave us the ability to freely go into the most holy place, which would be the secret place, which would, which would be, what else would it be? What else would it be called? Shadow of his wings. And where is that place right now? Where did he hide the thing? He put it inside us through our spirit. And your walk as a Christian to get a renewed mind is to learn how to get this to work with what's inside you. Isn't that powerful? So think about it. If the blood of bulls and goats was only good for a year, that would be like paying rent. Have you ever paid rent or paid a house payment? How good is that house payment? Until next month. Is there another one coming? And then you pay that one and what happens? What happens if you miss one? You, you, go, you go move in with Rory and Linda. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying? But Jesus came and he said, here's the deed to the house. Now I want you to think about this. Here's the deed to the house where you can freely come and go. So if God gave us the deed to the house, why are we hanging out in the, in the backyard sleeping under a tree instead of coming into the house? How come we're struggling to believe that that's the case? Jesus gave us everything. He delivered it to us and said, here you go. It's all yours. But whenever you hear, see, see, we don't understand a lot of things about God, myself included. A lot of times whenever you hear people preaching hard on sin, what covenant are they talking about? Because Hebrews tells you that that original covenant made them think about sin. Everybody look here. <laughs> that original covenant made you think about what? Sin. So if you have a sin consciousness, if you're always worried about sinning, what do you do? Sin. Has anybody here ever sinned? Okay. Somebody said, of course. Well, I don't know if you have or haven't. <laughs> you may have this down. <laughs> but the Lord taught me one day, I did a really bad thing. And I'm not going to tell you what it is. Unless you give me 50 bucks. It was really bad. <laughs> uh, so I, I remember the Lord saying to me, now you have a choice. You can stay here and fellowship with this. And what does that fellowship look like? Guilt, condemnation, regret. What else? What else comes in whenever you miss it in the big shame? What else? Pride. And then you say, I'll never do that again. Which means, wait till this wears off because next week I'm going to do it again. Right? Because we're creatures of habit, we keep going into the same pattern. It's an iniquity. God never takes something away without giving you something. He always replaces, okay? So the Lord said, you have a choice. You can fellowship with this for the next four or five days, 
or by faith you can operate in my grace and know that I forgave you. And now regardless of how you feel, you can fellowship with me and raise your hands and worship God. The biggest thing that, 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 that we have to learn is to go back in again. Can anybody relate to that? Yes. To go back in again. And that hadn't been taught very much. I mean, I don't know. I can remember being... How many, how many of you guys have been born again 55 times? <laughs> okay, this time I'm going to do it just to make sure. So when people call me and they say, I, I'm not real sure if I'm saved. I say, great. Let's say you're not. So mark the date right now. And let's pray the sinner's prayer and let's get you saved. Right? Do I think they're saved? Yes. Do you think they're saved? Yes. Do they think they're saved? They don't know. Because they're still trying to take the blood of bulls and goats and pay a price that's only going to be good for a, for a year instead of saying, hey, Jesus did it once and for all. And by the way, he didn't take the blood of bulls and goats. He took his blood. That's the difference. And for a will to take place, somebody has to die. So he died for us so that, so that we could inherit everything. All right, so let's roll to, um, does anybody have any questions? Seriously, does anybody have any questions? Good. All right, you guys got it. Okay, pull out your books, get a piece of paper. This is going to be a pop quiz. That's a joke. Hebrews 5, verses 1 through 5. So I was laying in bed. Anybody laid in bed? And I put on the tape at night. If you don't put on the Bible at night, I don't know what to tell you. If you want to hear from God, put it on and let it play. And you'll wake up at exactly the point that you need to hear something. Isn't that the most amazing thing? So I'm laying in bed, and the Lord says, uh, he's in Hebrews. If you haven't read Hebrews in the Message Bible, that's, that is what you need to do this week. It'll, it'll lay everything out, explain everything. So it was in Hebrews, and, and I used to only go to Hebrews. I would catch Hebrews 5 and 6, which talked about the difference between good and evil. And I can remember whenever God broke that. Do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all parables? So good is you follow God, evil is you go your own way. Good is you're single-minded, uh, evil is you're double-minded. It's not about that you can discern somebody has a devil. That's not what that's talking about. That's part of the gifting, which comes next, which he calls milk. He calls raising the dead milk. And I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh. So basically, we've taught milk. We haven't gone on to the deeper things. And I'll show you the analogy. Then he goes back to this again in Hebrews 6. I'm like, how did you sneak that in there? And I never saw it. So I would go there. Then I'd go to Hebrews 11. What's, what, is, what is Hebrews 11? The Hall of Fame, man, the Hall of Faith, right? I'd go there. And then I would sneak over to uh, Hebrews 13, 8, which is Jesus Christ the same today, you know, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And that was about it for me in Hebrews. Has anybody read a book like that? I mean, you just know a little bit out of the book and that kind of thing. I can't tell you how many times I've read Hebrews. I kind of had it, but I didn't. The Holy Ghost broke it open. And when he broke it open, oh my gosh. It was 4 o'clock in the morning. I told Sharon, let's take a walk. So if you see weird people walking in, in the big tree area at 4 in the morning, that's Sharon and I. And I'm sitting there just going. And she's like, I said, did you get all that? Yes. You know, it's that revelation just blew open. And I said, oh, my gosh, this is a really good book. So I've been sharing it with everybody, and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I learned that 20 years ago. And you're like, oh, my. So anyway, here we go. I just got it. Not really, but I, but I did. Hebrews 5, 1 says, here we go. For every high priest taking from among men. Now, was Jesus taken from among men, or was he taken from God? Jesus came from God, right? For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God. Now, all that is saying is that they're, that they're about God's business. And who, and who in particular is he speaking of here? The high priest. The high priest, right? Remember, Jesus is the high priest of your confession, so since we're in the Holy of Holies, yes, he is our high priest because he made a way that we could go into the Holy of Holies and hang out there all the time. 
Here's the reason that we struggle with problems. We come out of the Holy of Holies to take care of our problems instead of staying in there. And, and Gene pointed this out years ago. Joshua, remember Moses would go into the tent of meeting and hang out with God. Then he'd come back out and take care of the people. Where did Joshua stay? He stayed in the tent. And Joshua defeated 31 nations. That's pretty good. That's even better than the Kansas City Chiefs. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men and things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. So what are those gifts and sacrifices? Really? It's quiet in this church, this denominational church. The blood of bulls and goats. Remember how they had to, they had to remember that? I mean, have you, if you guys ever read Exodus and Deuteronomy and Numbers where he's talking about, you know, taking the leg and taking the guts and taking the bowels and sprinkling the blood and, whoo, glory to God. And here's how he got dressed, and here's how you did this. And every single thing he shared means something today. You can bring it all back to Jesus. It's all the type of shadow of Jesus. Okay, so he's getting everything ready to go into the holy place. Next verse. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weaknesses. Okay? So he's, he's like us. Next one. Because of this, he's required, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sins. So whenever the high priest went in, he's not only, he's not only offering, a, uh, offering a sacrifice for Rachel and David, but he's also doing it himself. Right? Okay, next one. Oh, by the way, Jesus did the same thing, didn't he? Next one. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God... Just as Aaron was. Now, this is an Old Testament. This is a type and a shadow, right? Old Testament, Old Covenant. Next verse. So also Christ. So also Jesus, right? Did not glorify himself to become high priest. He didn't do it to be high priest. He did it to, he did it to set us free so that, so that we could freely come and go and be victorious in this life, right? But it was he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. In other words, what the father's saying is I'm going to sacrifice Jesus to become the high priest. You got to understand, he's got to pull that, we got to, uh, we got to pull that veil down, right? All right. We're going to jump to, uh, let's go to verse 7. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. You're doing a great job. Verse 7. I kind of volunteered, Chris. <laughs> well, I want him to be in church. You have to be in church if you have to do the word and you can't move. Yeah, he's got to be here. That's how you get your kids in church. You make them do something. You got to give them a job. See, that's a secret. How do you know? Because my mom and dad did that to me. You're going to clean up the pews after church. Really? I thought we had somebody hired. Oh, no, no. That's not a big deal. You're going to do that. I'm like, okay. And I would watch people. Are you drinking something in here? You better not drink anything. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death, he was heard because of his godly fear. Who is this? Who's he talking about here? Jesus. Look at it again. Who in the days of his flesh, when, when was that? When he walked the earth, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries. He's in intercession. He's interceding for us. Does everybody know what intercession means? Intercession is a real deep, guttural, deep within your soul cry of, inter of, 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 of mercy for someone who's in, a, who's in a very precarious situation and may die if you don't pray for them. Has anybody ever had that happen? You know, oh my God, we got to pray for Chris. Oh my God, we got to pray for Sally. Oh my God, we got to pray for so-and-so, right? And then, and then you ask them, what happened two or three weeks ago? You're not going to believe this. I was driving down the street, car ran the red light, for some reason, my car supernaturally was on the other side of the car. The car went into the ditch, killed two people, but I'm fine. Intercession. 
you're praying for somebody else. Next verse. Are we, already, are we already at the next verse? Did you beat me there? Okay, verse 8. Though he was a son, look at this, yet he learned obedience by the things which he... Okay. So we don't understand in Western culture anything about hard times. Not really. Because we think if something hard hits us, that, you know, we've missed God. Has anybody ever heard that? I came up in word and faith. Anybody come up in word and faith? There's, there's like three of us. Does anybody, does, who does not know what word and faith means? Okay. We live by the word and faith. So, so we're quoting to everything. And back then, if you missed, if something happened, well, you need to go check your heart. Well, let me tell you something. Life happens. It says it's going to rain on the just and the unjust alike. I know I'm stepping on toes, but that's okay. I, I, that's why I wore my boots tonight. Just because something happens doesn't mean you miss God. In fact, let me tell you something. Every time I've done something for God, it was pretty hard. And every time I've done something from God, I couldn't afford it. Can anybody relate to that? And I, and, I, and I had to figure it out. Has God ever told you? I can remember years ago, we had just moved from uh, Amarillo, Texas to Tulsa. We were going to go to Ramah Bible Training Center. This was 1980. I, I got accepted in 80. I didn't go. And I didn't go in 81. In fact, I didn't go, period. God said move to Tulsa, not go to Ramah. Ramah's the name of the school. We don't have any money. I mean, we are so broke that we can't even pay attention. And back then, you could go to Pizza Hut and get their buffet for like 250 So I think we had, I think I, think I, I think I had five bucks on me or something. So I thought, well, this is our last meal. So we're just going to eat this, and then we're going to die after this. <laughs> well, I'm just married. I had enough money. I'll, I'll tell you two, two miracle stories. I had enough money to get into this apartment, but I had no furniture. Has anybody been there? We just got married. So we, had, we, found a, we found a cardboard box in the back that was our table. We had a coffee cup with a phone book on it. That was the other chair. And then this chair was, was a milk crate I found in the alley. And then we were sleeping on a pallet. And as happy as we could be until I wasn't happy as I could be. So we're sitting here eating. And I heard the scripture, the, the Lord feeds the birds of the field. They don't worry. They don't do this. Why do you worry? And I have to tell you, I saw the fattest sparrow I've ever seen land on the window. <laughs> and how that sparrow landed on the... I don't even know how the thing could fly. <laughs> he was so fat. You ever seen a fat bird? I was like, my gosh, man. <laughs> Do you know why God loves us? Because he gave us the chicken. The chicken has the best meat, and it can't fly away. That's proof that God loves you. That has nothing to do with this. So, so during that time, I can remember, if you've never been here, don't go back and do it again. But it's great memories. I mean, you just remember how it was back then, how you had to believe God for everything. And uh, the key is to continue to believe God for everything, no matter if you got money in your wallet or not. Because the Lord taught me, when you have a job, you better tell God, thank you for the job, because God is your source and not the job. God's your source, not the job. Because you can lose your job tomorrow. But God's still your source. You're not going to lose him, because you're in the Holy of Holies where all the money is anyway, right? Provision. And if you live there, how can anything happen? So we're going to move into this, into this condo. And we just had enough money to, 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 negotiate down the down, to, to negotiate down the down payment. You know, remember you had to put a deposit down? And I think the apartment was 250 bucks. It was a two-bedroom, one-bath, 250 bucks, which, I, which might as well have been $250 million at the time. And I remember the deposit was 150 So I negotiated the deposit. And I said, look, I'll pay half, but, you know, we will, we will shampoo the carpets, okay? So now I've got exactly 50 bucks on me. And I'm thinking, okay, so she's going to get a job as a dental She already had somebody that was going to hire her. And, and I was going to go to the Jewish clothing store, Renberg's, and I was going to get hired on for Christmas help. So it was a quick job. I could do it. I could sell clothes. Everything was hunky-dory, right? So I called Public Service Company of Oklahoma to tell them to turn on the electricity. And they said to me, great, that'll be $80. Come in and pay $80. 
I said, I'll call you back. I had $50. So I don't know, you know, and listen, I grew up in New Mexico, but 50 does not go into 80. It does, but there's still, there's still some left over, right? right? So I'm laying on the side of the bed, and I said, Lord, I need $80. Has anybody done that? You know what he said to me? Do you need $80 or do you need electricity? Oh, I need electricity. He says, then believe me for it. So driving over to pick up that, that carpet shampoo was faith. Because in my head, I'm thinking, I'm going to plug this into a wall where nothing's happening. We're going to sit there. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I could do candles for a week or two until I get paid. See, my mind's trying to figure it out. Remember this. Kenneth Hagin said it. I wish I had said it before him, but he said it before me. Faith will work in your heart with doubt in your head as long as you, as long as you keep your pie holes shut. You don't talk. Don't talk, because that's how we kill it. I listen to you guys talk. <laughs> I, I watch the thread. <laughs> I'm, I'm being nice. If I've offended you, oh well. Anyway. <laughs> no, it's true, though. What you say, you get. Well, that's, that's that name it and claim it stuff. You bet it is. Grab it and blab it. Yeah, all that stuff. But it's true. God, Jesus is the high priest of our confession. So when you say negative things, who jumps on board? The angels or somebody else? Probably somebody else. So as we were driving, Denise said to me, how are we going to do blah, blah, blah when we don't have any blah, 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 right? And I said, don't talk. Our electricity was paid for 2,000 years ago. So we, so we go pick it up. We come back with that, with that shampooer. And I'll never forget her saying, praise God, because we opened the door to the house and the light bulb was on. And the light bulb was not on before. See, that can go on all the time. It's supposed to go on all the time. You're supposed to live a supernatural life. That's supposed to be normal. And so, so I'm thinking, oh, that's cool. Hallelujah. So about a month later, I get a little thing on the door, the little door thing. It says, to whom it may concern, you owe us money. Come pay it. So I, now I got a job. So I take a check. I take that thing in and pay it. Then I'd leave. I did that for over six months. Just, they, they didn't even know who was there. They just said, who, to whomever's here, <laughs> you know, here's your bill. And I would just take that thing and I would write a check and I'd just go give it to them. And so one day the Holy Spirit said to me, he says, uh, he said, okay, go sign up. It's time to sign up. It's been six months. So I went down there. And I met the lady, and you got to understand, I'm from T Tulsa, was inundated with people coming to Bible schools, right? And everybody had a story. Everybody had a story of the miracle of how they got there. So the people at PSO were tired of hearing the miracle stories. So when I walked in, she goes, I could charge you $200 for this. How did that happen? And I said, God turned it on. She went, oh, come on. I, I, I can't hear another one of these stories again. She goes, how did you turn it on? I said, fill these hands. And she felt them. She goes, oh, it must have been God because it's sure not those hands because I have the softest hands in town. <laughs> so God will do that for you. The other day, I could not find my sunglasses. I was telling them this story. I can't find them. I'm, I'm ready to leave. And Sharon knows whenever I get ready to leave, it's like in and out, in and out. Who else leaves like that? Who can just leave organized in just one time? Anybody? Okay, Rory. He's the only one that I've ever met. I go in and out, in and out, in and out, right? Because I forget this, I forget that. I cannot find my sunglasses. They are not in my hand. They are not in my hand. Nowhere. And I said, you know what? And I, and I stopped, and they're not in my hands. Hear me. And as I go out to the car, I look down one more time, and guess what's in my hands? My sunglasses. Has anybody ever had that happen to him? You know what he's doing, don't you? He's patting you on the head to let you know he's still around. That's all he's doing. One day I couldn't find a, a, a hat and gloves. I looked all over for them, everywhere. And I went out to my car. I just left my car. I come back out to my car, and they were neatly folded in, in the seat. And I'm like, I'm not even getting in that car for a couple of days. <laughs> well, remember that time that I, that, that I had those notes on my computer? I put them in my computer, and I came here to show up, and I was going to preach that. Remember that, Sherry? And I opened my computer, and the notes are gone. I'm like, well, we're not going to preach that one. <laughs> That was on repent for your sins, you evil... No, no, I'm teasing. Go to Hebrews 6, verse 7 and 8. Hebrews 6, 7 and 8. 
You guys get anything out of this besides those goofy stories? You know, you'll get more out of stories than anything. All right, look at this. This is, this is awesome. Uh, verse 6, Chris. No, no, no. You're right, you're right. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it. So what's he talking about here? He's talking about parched soil. He's talking about people where, where rain has not rained on the ground. So we, so we can't blow this off. So what would be the ground? It'd be our field, right? Now, now, now look at this. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it. Often comes upon it. God is delivering all the time. We sometimes don't know how to receive what God is bringing. See, that's where the awareness comes in. And bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessings from God. Now, why, why would that occur? God tells you something, right? You put the seed in the ground and you're raising carrots and corn. If you, if you look at the Message Bible, it calls it carrots and corn. He takes that parched ground and turns it into carrots and corn. Now look at verse 8. But if it bears thorns and briars or thistles, so what kind of ground would this be? Thorny ground. And it's cares of life, deceitfulness of riches, lusts of other things have come in. Right? So, so Michelle shared with me today, have you ever had God tell you something and at the last minute, you lose faith. Has anybody ever had that happen? I have. And you know what you do? You just get up, dust yourself off, say, "Woo, that was horrible. Let's try that again." How many times do you do you do you get to try it again? Till you get it right. So what's he teaching us to do? He's teaching us how to live in the inner court where the glory is. And what we're doing is we keep walking out of the inner court, coming out here trying to fix our problems. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. So your dead works are going to be burned. He's going to purge your dead works. This is the same as in John 15. This is not talking about hell. He's talking about he's purging your dead works. When you're praying for the glory to come, what do you think is going to burn? <laughs> your thorns and briars I don't have any thorns and briars oh really okay so no one's here irritated by people <laughs> no one here worries <laughs> right the other day I, I came up and Sharon's in the kitchen and I'm trying to give her a hug and have you ever, man have you ever heard of stop because she's thinking but I'm trying to smooth it over and how well does that work Women, <laughs> thank God I stopped at stop and didn't get one of these. <laughs> so life happens, right? Let's turn to Hebrews eleven six. So now let me ask you this question. So what's happening then? So let's just look at this for a minute. Let's just before we before we look at this first. Let's just think about this for a minute. So Jesus has made a way for us to go into the inner court where the glory is. Is that true? Right, so, so we're believing God for the glory. It says, his glory will come on the earth. Anytime his glory has come, people have traveled from all over to go see the glory, right? But we just had a revival, what, last year? Not, and I remember two girls from our church driving 898 miles or hours to go there and come back. Why did they go? Because the glory of God's there. But there's also glory in your heart. I remember the first time I spent hours and hours and hours with Jesus and came out and started talking to people and they started falling over. And I'm like, ooh, I better quit talking. Whenever I got out of the annoying. So that's great, right? But this verse, but what's it designed for? What is all that designed for? To get people into the glory. Now, how do you bring people into the glory? How do you bring people into the inner court? Because, because we're not bringing the blood of bulls and goats, right? We're not, and remember, that had to be unblemished. It had to be your best. It had to be your absolute best, not your, not your second and third. That didn't work for God. Look, I brought you out of Egypt. I did this, this, and this. You better bring me your best. That's what he's saying. He's a jealous God. So if we give him his best, what's he going to give us? Oh, by the way, he always gives us his best. 
And the reason it takes a while sometimes for him to come is because we don't know how to operate in best because we're kind of goofy. And so God has to wait till we grow to the point where he can give it to you. He will give you provision in the meantime, but he ain't going to lay it on you until you're good to go. It's not about you trusting God. You've got to get over that part. It's about him trusting you. It's about him trusting you. I just talked, you guys know Corey? He just got an invite. He just got back from Pakistan. He did a revival and had 2,000 people born again. And just got an invite to go to the Czech Republic with uh, Todd White's organization. He goes, why do, you think I'm, why do you think they asked me to go? I said, that's easy. They know you'll do something. You're not going to get over there and freak out and fall apart. You're going to go do the gospel. See, God trusts people that he can depend. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Come on, man. You only get one chance at this. People are watching us. Ooh, okay, I'll be nice for a second. But look at here. So our job is to do what? Bring other people into the Holy of Holies. That's your job. Remember, remember a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about time, space, and matter. That's this realm. So we're bringing people out of this realm into the supernatural. But where are we bringing them in the supernatural? Holy of holies, into the glory, right? Where's Jesus hanging? Okay, Hebrews eleven six. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Now, why is he saying that? Because I'm trying to figure out how to keep people in. I, because I lay in bed at night thinking, if everybody who ever visited here came, we'd have 500 people in this church. We've had 500 people roll through this church. And that's probably every church. But, I mean, if we had all those people here, I think about things like that. And I'm thinking, if we had more glory, maybe they'd come. If this would happen, maybe they would come. But I found out that what happens is, is that we go into the glory and we come out. We go in and we come out. We go in and we come out. And, and once in a while, whenever we come out, we get tagged. And now, there's that song by uh, Toby Mac. It says, you only, you only call heaven when you're going through some drama. <laughs> Ooh. So I learned something. To have no drama, stay in heaven. You know, you can stay in heaven all the time. Well, how do you do that? I got to go to work. No, but you can still be in heaven when you go to work. Your awareness is on him. You're thinking about him all through the day. Well, I can't do that. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. I used to take breaks. I told you guys this. I would take a break in the middle of the day. So I got to go, go to the bathroom. I'd go sit in the bathroom for five, ten minutes and just worship God and come back out again because I hated my job. Has anybody ever hated your job? Remember the time I told you I had the Rolex and I fell asleep in the bathroom and the Rolex was on my head? And they were banging on the door. I fell asleep on the toilet and they said, somebody's here to see you. And I went over to the mirror and I had a Rolex insignia on my forehead. I'm like, I can't. So I just left and called him and said, tell him I had to go see a client. What am I saying? I was hungry for God. I want you to be hungry for God because your job is to bring other people into the Holy, into the holy of Holies. Quit trying to get them born again. Quit, quit trying to do all that stuff. Just learn to bring them into the Holy of Holies. Lost people are not only people that aren't going to heaven. We have lost people sitting on the pews who don't know how to get out of their situations. How do you know? Because I was one for years. I was so frustrated. It was unbelievable. Have you ever been frustrated? Yeah. I'd sit there and I was under some great men of God. And I'd listen to them. I'd say, if I could only preach, glory to God. And then they said, sit there. And they had me on the front row where I couldn't move. But you know what I learned? I learned that, that the Holy Spirit was trying to get me to the point where he could trust me. That's what God's doing right now. He loves you. I'll give you an example. Does anybody have a kid that's going through driver's education? Has anybody ever had a kid that went through driver's education? Has anybody ever had a kid that's 13 or 14 take your car and you don't know where the car is? I was that kid. You were that kid. <laughs> My son was that kid. But not only was it him, but there were six or seven other people in the car with him. Did your parents trust you? No. But as you grew up and you became responsible and you were out on your own and your mom said, hey, can you, can you pick me up? I, I got to go to the doctor's office. Did she trust you then? That's God's no different. He's a good parent. He's a good parent. Amen. 
That's why you don't want to, that's why you don't want to waste a problem. But without faith, it is, why is it impossible to please him? No, don't. Why is it impossible to please him if you're, if you're not doing it with faith? Doubt and unbelief. Double-minded. And faith is a spiritual act, right? And those who worship God worship him in spirit and truth. Hallelujah. Okay. For he who comes to God. So what's the first thing you got to do? You got to go to God. First off, you got to say, hey, I'm going to use faith and then I'm going to go to God. But look at this one. He must believe that he is. Oh, I believe that he is. I know you do. I did a service in um, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Buckle on the Bible, but Wednesday night. These are the hardcore Christians that come on Wednesday night. And the Lord said, I want you to give an altar call because there's people here that don't believe I'm real. Mm. And I said, I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, right. in a charismatic church. They know you're real. He goes, no, 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 do the altar call. Come on. I said, what? He goes, do the altar call. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I was looking for a job when I went into ministry. I guess I could go back to work again. Because <laughs> after I make this altar call, nobody's coming up. The aisles were full. There was two aisles coming in, and the people only got to here, and they were falling over. There was two piles of people. Were, were you there that night, Gene? There was two piles of people on both sides. And I'm sitting there going, I wonder... I mean, honestly, and the Lord started teaching me, if, if you can, you can, you can, you can, um, you can, come on, words come. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm. The Lord is saying that he wants us to know him as a father. Many of us have known him as a partner. Many of us have, have known him as a stepfather. Many of us have looked at, and I'm prophesying to you right now. Many of us have, have looked at him as if he was someone who provided for us. But, but the example of fathers we had weren't very good. And the Holy Spirit is saying, I am a good father, and I'm encouraging you to come forward. I'm encouraging you to, to, to get to know me. I'm encouraging you to walk in my grace and walk in my goodness. Because I'm depending on you, says the Spirit of grace, because you're going to help me with this harvest that's coming. Because there was a prophet of old that said there would be a billion souls saved, and I'm still believing that, and I'm still moving in that direction. And you should be part of that move, says the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Ooh, glory. I feel like I'm back in Tulsa again. Hallelujah. Lord, it stopped me back in the old days like that to prophesy. Mm. It's really cool whenever he wants to talk. For, oh. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Okay, last scripture, and then I'm done. It's only 7.26. Let's go to Matthew 14. I shared it today. I actually pulled this out that, I, that I, I wrote this two years ago on Jesus walking on the water. I didn't see it. I knew that we had to have some way to get people to get into the Holy of Holies. Because people come and they get committed, right? And then something happens and they fall away. Then they get in trouble again and they come back. And then they fall away. And then, and, then they're, and then they're in a good place, and then they're in a bad place. Has anybody seen that? And I'm not even talking about the world. I'm talking about the body of Christ. So the quickest way I know to stay in the Holy of Holies is to start bringing people into the Holy of Holies. That's his call. That's what God wants. Everybody's praying for glory across the country right now. But if it's not about getting people in, into that place with him, why... I'll share this story. Has anybody ever heard of a British sports car in the 50s or 60s? I had a TR7 Triumph. Great cars. Only two problems. The carburetors were horrible and the electrical system was worse. So I had this TR7 and it, and it had hidden lights. And sometimes it was a 1975 and it was a bullet. And I was a fraternity boy in college with a TR7, which is kind of loco. It's a miracle that I'm alive. So because a, a, a 19-year-old kid is not going to drive a TR7 30 miles an hour. <laughs> I wonder if I can do 150 on this turn. You know, you know, fun stuff like that. So, but you would turn the lights off sometimes, and, and one light would go down, the other one would stay up. So you had a winking car. So you had to get out, and you had to loosen that little air pump thing, and it would go back down. You'd tighten it back up, and it'd work again for the next 20, 25 times. 
And then you had to take it in all the time to get it adjusted because the carbs were horrible. The points were bad. The carburetor was bad. You always had to go get it adjusted. So the Lord gave me a vision. Everybody is praying for glory to come. And I saw a sports car sitting under a tree. And I saw a sports car in a garage on blocks. And I walked up to him and said, whose car was this? And do you know what they said? It was my great uncle's, it was my grandfather's, it was my dad. They were a mechanic and they knew how to maintain it so the car ran well. Why aren't you driving it? I don't know how to maintain it. We're asking for glory that, that we have to learn to be mechanics with God in order for the glory to come because he's not going to park glory cars under trees anymore. He's looking for those who are serious about the things of God and who want to see glory come on this earth. All right, so for without faith, it's impossible to please God because those who come to him must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of those who casually seek him. Only go see him when drama happens. Are there all the time? Okay, here we go. Matthew 14, 22. This is a really good story, and I'm sure you guys have heard it a hundred times. But let's look at it one more time. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. I love that term, immediately. You know, you know when God tries to answer your prayers? Immediately. Why does it take so long? Why is it the 11th hour? Sometimes he's got to line this back up again. We're out of position. We're out of position. Because we flip-flop. So God sends the miracle here. And by the time it hits us, we're over here. Okay, let's try it this way. So he sends it over there. And by the time it gets there, we're over here. So he sends it here. And by the time it gets there, we're over there. Sounds like it. Or let, or let God hold us down. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitude away. He was praying by himself and he, and he sent the disciples off. Next verse. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. I bet he was thankful for that, don't you? Having some time by himself finally. Next verse. I mean, I could go into that. There, there's so much symbolism there, it's crazy. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. In other words, he's in the middle of a storm. Has anybody been on a Wyoming lake in the middle of a storm and the waves are, are popping? Is it fun? No. You want off the lake. Casey has a story where she was on a boat down in Mexico, down in the Sea of Cortez, and a whale hits their boat and capsizes the boat and throws Casey out of the boat. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of d doing this quickly. Casey's still holding her Pringles can, and she's watching the whale's tail go down. She had enough sense to go under. It's a miracle she's even alive. It, 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 it knocked the, the captain out, and the boat started sinking. And, and her dad is there with, with two of his daughters. And the one guy's got his teeth knocked out. And I guess, I don't know what the other guy was doing, but how would you feel as a parent with, with the boat sinking with your daughters right here in the middle of the ocean? Man. <laughs> and a whale hit it. Now that, come on, you can't make that up. Can anybody beat that story? That's a whale story. <laughs> can he? That's a good fish story. <laughs> Jonah can relate to it. <laughs> Only Jonah. <laughs> right. They said that Moby Dick was so, who was it? Captain Bly was so optimistic that, that he went to uh, go hunt for Moby Dick with uh, soy sauce in his, in his boat. You know, it's interesting because whenever you read the Message Bible, it tells you, go seek God and not self-help. And if you look right now, there's 10 ways to accomplish this. There's 10 ways to do this. One of it says, stoic philosophy, don't talk to anybody and be mean. The other one is, stoic philosophy, talk to everybody and be kind. I mean, there's all kinds of philosophies out there. There's all kinds of experts. There's one guy that I love to watch. He's saying that we're in such trouble that we need to build space. And this guy went to Harvard, and he's a physicist with a doctorate from Harvard, saying that we need to, we need to get spaceships going to Mars and 10 different planets right now. And the Lord says, do you think I put you on the earth for it to fall apart and blow up? So you've got to understand, anything that talks about limiting the earth and limiting people is the enemy. God is about people coming in. He wants more babies. He's got plenty of room. 
And remember in that realm, if heaven is not big enough, he can make it bigger if he has to. So anytime you see something that wants to limit the population, like abortion, like some of those issues, on and on and on. I don't have any issue with the people. But, but whenever you start limiting people, I mean, you know, rael has been with us now for nine months. I can't even imagine not having Rael around. What if she wasn't around? That's what I'm saying. God wants more people. He said to replenish the earth. He didn't say in 2024 that, that the earth wasn't going to be big enough and it was going to blow up. So build spaceships to go to another planet. Glory to God. I mean, Preach. all right, I'm going to keep moving. I'm not preaching, I'm meddling. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the wind and the waves, and it was contrary. Now look at this. Here we go, next verse. Now, in the fourth watch, when, when is the fourth watch? Does anybody know? Late at night? Late, okay. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea, which is a normal day, right? Just walking on the sea, like it's no big deal. Next verse. So let me ask you a question. Why was Jesus able to walk on the water? Why? He believed he could, because why did he believe he could? Because he knew his father was, and because, but still, why? Why did he believe he could? It was more of a reality to him. The supernatural was more of a reality than the natural. Because the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And when he saw the disciples, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. Sounds like the church today. Revival's coming here. No, no, it's coming here. No, we got to do this. No, we got to do that. No, you got to wear a dress. No, you got to, you can't have tattoos. You can't have earrings. You can't do this. You can't do that. And I'm going, ah, stop. Remember back in the 60s, you couldn't have long hair? Am I the one that remembers that? I tried to grow long hair in the 60s and 70s. You know how well that went? Remember you go get a haircut and your dad would say, you'd talk to him like, leave a little bit on the side. And he'd say, cut it. That was horrible. Yeah. yeah, I can relate. And when the disciples saw him walk on the, on the sea, they thought he was a ghost. Next one. They're in fear. So that's not faith, right? Are they in the inner court? Not even close. But immediately, I love how Jesus does things right now. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is me. Do not be afraid. Okay, so the, isn't that great? You're out on the boat it's, it's, and it's dark. It's, it's not like it is now. And the waves are going, and this ghost-looking guy is coming and saying, hey, it's all good, guys. Chill out. <laughs> oh, I feel better already. <laughs> Do you think they were still okay? I don't think they were. <laughs> Next one. And when Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Next one. So he said, where's the seed? God gave him a seed. What's the seed? Come. come. Okay, that's the seed, right? Yeah. Now, now, let's see what Peter does. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walks on the water to Jesus. That's pretty good, isn't it? All right, next verse. I mean, think about it. He was a wet water walker. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, if you got a minute, you're not too busy. And I know I'm not worthy to be your son. And I know that you don't hear me like you do everybody else. And I know how you love Pastor Brad more than me. <laughs> Ego. No, I'm not going to repent. I am God's favorite son. Aren't you? You better be. Rich, are you God's favorite son? <laughs> you better be. God treats you like an only child. Have you noticed that? But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and he cried and he sank and he said, Lord, save me. So he got the word, right? And what happened? Did it, so he gets, the, he gets the word. He doesn't have hard soil because he got into the water. He doesn't really have rocky soil. Not really because he's, you know, he got out there and did it. Was it thorny soil? The seafulness of riches, lust of other things came in and choked the word. That's what happened. He got into thorny soil right here. He showed his soil. So he goes from single to double. The word that God gave him got choked out. 
Is that fair enough? Okay, next verse. And immediately, see there's three and immediately. Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Now look at the next verse. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. So here's what happens. Single-minded, single-minded, waves, waves, waves. He walks out sinking, double-minded. Those who believe that God is must diligently seek him. Was he diligently seeking God at that point? If you're sinking in the water, are you diligently seeking God? I'm diligently seeking him. <laughs> I don't know about you. I ain't here debating anything. Help! Right? And he grabs him right there, right? Picks him up. And together, they become single-minded again and walk back to the boat. Single-minded. See, what we've done with this scripture is we beat Peter up. Because we have a Western mindset. That guy walked on the water three... That's right. That's right. See, she got it. Hallelujah. <laughs> three quarters of his trip... He got it. Three quarters of his trip, he's single-minded. So what are we doing? How do we stay into this thing? We find Jesus. We become aware of Jesus, and we talk to him on stuff all through the day. Okay, it's tax season. When you're, whenever you're tax CPA, is everybody okay? Is everybody done? I'm almost done. Whenever your CPA says, send me something, do you doubt him? Oh, I'm not going to send that. I don't think you know anything. Do you, do you do that? What do you do? You go find it and you send it to him. How come we're not doing the same on every single issue in our life? That's what he's asking us to do. He's asking us to find him. I'm going to give you one more story. Mark 4. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. Right? That was a seed. Remember? There are, they, they are going at night. It's, it's, it's a stormy night. It's dark. It's the worst time to go. Other ships are going. They're going to the other side. He goes to sleep. They believe that he is. You know how come they believe that he is? Because I saw him walking across the water, and I see him in the back of the boat asleep. I believe that he is. As the, as the boat fills up, what do they do? How do they wake him up? Casually or diligently. Didn't they diligently run back there? There's no... Yeah, this is, this is not the kind of thing where Rachel's going, David, you go. No, 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 you go. No, 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 you go. No, we're going. We'll both go, right? And so they get him up. What happened? He says the same thing. Why didn't you have faith? But he turns them back to being single-minded because they're aware of what he can do. They're aware of the authority that he has, and they go to the other side. You see that? So let's look at Hebrews 11, 6 one more time. And then we're done. Did you guys get anything out of that? Yeah. I preached to me tonight. <laughs> Woo, glory. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. Kick to verse 1 real quick in the same chapter. So we've quoted this, and we've quoted it, and we've quoted it, and we've quoted it, and we've quoted it. Let's look at it differently tonight. You want to? I didn't have this on here, but I just thought of this. Now faith. Now did you know it's three times Jesus did what? Was he slowly or did he do it when? Immediately. Immediately. Now faith. Right now faith. Right now faith. Not tomorrow. Not, you know, not ten minutes. Why did we wait so long? You're no sense? We're, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And then something happens. My, the Lord told me to call my sister for two weeks and I hesitated. And then, my, then I got word from my dad that my sister passed away. And I thought, you know, the Lord is trying to get me to talk to her for two weeks, and I didn't do it. How come I just didn't immediately pick up the phone? Tonight, when it, whenever he told me to send that text, I did it immediately. Now faith is the substance of the things hoped for. So what did Peter want when he was on the water? What, what did he want? He wanted to walk. Did he want to sink? Did he, did, he, did he want to drown? No. He wanted to drown? No, he, didn't want, he didn't want to drown. Jesus could raise him if he drowned, I guess. Get up. He'd be the next one to get, set, to, to get risen from the dead. But, but that's the thing he wanted, right? What did, what did the disciples want when they were on the boat? 
They want to get to the other side in peace, right? That's their reasoning, all right? Substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Can you see the glory in you right now? But you know it's there. How come, how come you know it's there? Scripture says so. But you got, uh, you, you got chill bumps once. Doesn't that count? You felt the anointing and fell over one day. Doesn't that count? You actually went into the glory at, at Asbury. Does, doesn't that count? No. It's great that it came. Right, Jeff? It's great that it came. But it's in you because of what? Because the word of God told you that. And as you fellowship with him, God talks to you from here, not up here. Well, I don't know about that. I can prove it to you. You can pray in the Holy Ghost. You can pray in tongues in your mind. And you can also think about other things. You, you can pray in, in tongues or you can pray in tongues out loud. And you can think about other things driving down the street. It's got to be two different places, right? Because your mind can only do one thing at a time. Holy Ghost can do whatever he wants. That's where God speaks to you. Pray in tongues. Go quiet. Pray inside you. And just let it go. And then let the Holy Spirit start talking to you. You'll find where God talks to you. You won't be deceived so much. You won't be deceived when somebody says, God called me to do this. And then two minutes later, they're gone. Ooh, that was her noggin trying to help. You learn to find out where he comes from. The more that you get to know him, the more that you fellowship with him. Secret places in here. You learn to go into here. You learn to hear. Learn to go in the spirit. All right. Glory to God. So, Father, we thank you that you are a good God. Glory to God. Thank you for the secret place. Thank you for the inner court. Thank you for the glory. Mm. Father, thank you that the glory is in us. Father, teach us, teach us to bring other people into the glory. My Lord just said, so what's the safe word? What's the safe word God gives us? Love your neighbor, right? You guys can look at me for a minute. Love your neighbor is a safe word, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you, do you know why the Ten Commandments were in the ark, in my opinion? Because you can fulfill all Ten Commandments with, with only two commands. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love, love your God. You fulfill the whole thing. What did Jesus come doing? He brought, he brought love. He says, you can now love. Remember that time he, he took me 300 times over and over and over and said, love my children, love my children, love my children, love my children, love my children. He told me three times, you can come up higher. And I've said it, and I'll say it again. We pray 300 times to come up higher and three times to love. 300 times to come up higher and three times to love Jesus. Love his children. Hallelujah. If you want more of God, today I was at the gym. And a girl that comes here occasionally walks up to me. She goes, I hate people. I was like, she goes, pray for me. And I'm like, I don't know if I can. <laughs> What's going on? So she's working out. Has anybody worked out? And somebody grabs her weights and somebody gets on her machine. Does it, doesn't that bug you? It's horrible. She goes, how do I get, how do I get to where I, this doesn't affect me anymore? I go, what do you do when you work out? You keep doing it. You keep going through the pain, right? Until one day, it's nothing to pick up a 20-pound weight, right? Walking in love with people is the same way. Make sure you get in the most funky situations possible so you can learn how to love people. Don't pray for it. It'll come. All you got to do is get up tomorrow morning and say, I'm going to walk in love today. And the devil will make sure to test you on that. But do you know how you get through? Yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because your rod and your staff are with me. And it's going to lead me and comfort me into the secret place. And I'm going to grab these people in hog time and pull them with me into the secret place. And once I get them into the secret place, guess what? They don't need any more convincing from me. Now they're going to go. That's why... The model of one guy preaching is not the way it's going to be. You guys are supposed to go out and do it. You guys are supposed to go out and do it. And the people who bug you the most, start working on them. There's a guy that goes to another church. He, is, he never says hi. Never says hi. So I was going to get offended. I thought, no, I'm not going to get offended. He's my project. The other day he said hi to me at the gym. I almost fell over. <laughs> I got another guy that puts on his hood and just works, won't look around. How you doing? Mm. One of those kind of, I call them pre-Christians. I purposely, now I go up to him. He's a big dude. I'm praying for, you guys pray for me. I, say, I, I go up to him purposely and say, how you doing? What's going on? Arr. But guess what? Guess what he did the other day when he was walking in. How's it going, man? I was like, Lord to God. 
help me, I'm drowning. <laughs> so I, if you have people that you don't like, good. <laughs> so Father, help us with the people we don't like. <laughs> even ourselves, yes, I heard that. Even I said, even yourself? Yes, even ourselves. You got to love yourself before you can love other people. Hallelujah. So, <laughs> let's turn the light, Rory, let's turn the lights down. If you're online, yeah, thank you, Gene. If you're, <laughs> hallelujah, glory to God, hallelujah. We got to get that prophetic word off the tape. We need to get the prophetic word off the tape and, 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 and write it out. Can we do that? So, if you're on, let, let, let me just pray for people who are in television land. So, so if you've got something tonight and God is speaking to you, just reach out to us, brad at hisoutpouring.com or 307-200-0228. Um, I just speak a blessing. Father, I just, I just thank you that, that, that you're calling people from all over the world to go out and to bring people back into the secret place. Jesus did an amazing job. He, he ripped the veil in, in half. He used his blood. He lets us freely walk in there. Father, give us the wisdom to get people in there. I just pray that for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. I'm glad that you joined us. For more information, reach out to us at 307-200-0228. That's our church line. Or you can go online to hisoutpouring.com to get more information. And you can also reach us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok at His Outpouring Church. If you're in Casper, Wyoming, make sure you come join us. You'll find us at East Ridge Mall off of Center Court. So thanks again. Have a great week.